Hello everyone. So we are continuing the session, the single, uh, the closed textual reading of the text at hand, uh, the objective is ethics by Ayn Rand. This is the second and concluding part of it. As uh, described earlier, uh, this is a part of module 2 and but this is only for people who would like a closed reading of the text. In case uh, you would like to just stick with the basic outlines and the concepts, uh, this textual reading uh, it need not be a part of your curriculum. However, if you are and I recommend, if you want to understand how to closely read a text, develop your reactions to a text, it is a good idea to hold your patience and go through this reading and uh, which we do together and basically I do it soliloquy and I imagine you there and uh, have uh, reactions that come along as I read. And these are reactions that generate only when you do a closed reading. So I hope it is of some benefit to you. And uh, now let us continue with uh, where we stopped off in the last reading on page 21 as the difference between standard and purpose. Now here uh, we see we find that uh, the author makes a difference uh, terminological clarity uh, which uh, helps to make the broader argument. In my style of reading I value uh, terminological clarity but I do not focus too much on it. Your style might differ. Uh, typically analytic philosophers or a school of philosophy called analytic philosophy were the ones who were very concerned about the tools of the uh, exercise. So the conceptual tools or the uh, defining the terms of one's argument as crucial to almost determining one's argument. So uh, there are various ways to read and definitely there is no one uh, perfect way to read. You need to discover your own style of reading what kind of text. Uh, what kind of uh, uh, close reading you would do. This is one sample, I present my sample. You can develop your own sample, but you to have a close reading on that. Okay. So, let us uh, uh, start on from where we ended in the last reading, uh, the yellow highlighted section that you can see here. So, the difference between standard and purpose in this context is as follows. A standard is an abstract principle that serves as a measurement or a gauge to guide a man's choice in the achievement of a concrete specific purpose. That which is required for the survival of man qua man is an abstract principle that applies to every individual man. The task of applying this principle to concrete specific purpose, the purpose of living a life proper to a rational being belongs to every individual man and the life he has to live uh, is his own. So, uh, here is a terminological difference between standard and purpose, not very crucial to the big picture, but to bring clarity in how she distinguishes between standard and purpose. Man must choose his actions, values, goals by the standard of that which is proper to man. In order to achieve, maintain, fulfill and enjoy that ultimate value, that end in itself which is, is a, his own life. Value is that which one acts or gains to keep, virtue is uh, the act by which one gains and or keeps it. The three cardinal values of objectivist ethics, the three values which together are the means to and uh, to and the realization of one's ultimate value, one's own life are reason, purpose, self-esteem with their three corresponding virtues, rationality, productiveness and pride. So, here is where a crucial uh, claim of the paper is being advanced over here that what are the cardinal virtues and what are the values uh, the, which are the goals and virtue as the act by which one reaches that. So, what are the values and the corresponding virtues that the objectivist ethics uh, highlights and that those are you see reason purpose, self-esteem, these three and they come from the corresponding virtues of rationality, productiveness and pride. Now, continuing, uh, productive work is the central purpose of a, rational, of a ma uh, rational man's life, the central value that integrates and determines the hierarchy of all his other values. Reason is the source, the precondition of his productive work pride is the result. Rationality 
is man's basic virtue, the source of all other virtues. Man's basic vice, the source of all evils is the act of the unfocusing mind. So, a human being's basic virtue is now coming out to be, the claim is rationality, not kindness, not empathy, not emotion, not altruism, but rationality. Rationality as the source from which everything else comes into being and thereby what is the basic vice is not uh, selfishness or uh, uh, wickedness, but not being focused, unfocusing one's mind as she talks about it, right. Okay. So, uh, this, uh, what is unfocusing his mind? The suspension of his consciousness, which is not blindness, but the refusal to see, not ignorance, but the refusal to know. Irrationality is the rejection of the man's, of, uh, man's means of survival and therefore, a commitment to a course of blind destruction. That which is anti-mind is anti-life. So, uh, it is not the lack of knowledge, but the refusal to know. It is not the uh, uh, suspension of his consciousness, which is not blindness, but the refusal to see. That is the trouble. So, when one does not exercise the choice or exercises the choice not to focus. The virtue of rationality means the recognition and acceptance of reason as one's only source of knowledge, one's only judge of values and one's only guide to action. It means one's total commitment to a state of full conscious awareness, to the maintenance of a full mental focus in all issues, in all choices in all of one's waking hours. It means a commitment to the fullest perception of reality within one's power and to the constant active expansion of one's perception, that is of one's knowledge. It means a commitment to the reality of one's existence, that is to the principle that all of one's goals, values and actions take place in reality and therefore, that one must never place any value or consideration whatsoever above one's perception of reality. It means a commitment to the principle that all of one's convictions, values, goals, desires and actions must be based on, derived from, chosen and validated by a process of thought, as precise and scrupulous a process of thought directed by as ruthlessly strict an application of logic as one's fullest capacity permits. It means one's acceptance of the responsibility of forming one's own judgments and of living by the work of one's own mind, which is the virtue of independence. It means that one must never sacrifice one's convictions to the opinions or wishes of others, which is the virtue of integrity. That one must never attempt to fake reality in any manner, which is the virtue of honesty. That one must never seek or grant the unearned and undeserved, neither in matter nor in spirit, which is the virtue of justice. So, if you see here, independence, integrity, honesty and justice, these are the four uh, crucial uh, virtues that uh, the author talks about and you can connect it with the lived experience. Eh? Look at uh, valuing, uh, look at the last one, the notion of justice is uh, never to seek or grant the unearned. So, the whole notion of dole, the whole notion of uh, subsidy is suspect, is a question, is something deplorable and the notion of, if you look at the connector notion of copyrights and patents, that an idea is not universal, an idea that has been created or that uh, uh, an idea that has been actioned by somebody due regard has to be given to that person. Neither should that person grant nor should others seek the unearned. So, if somebody has worked on an idea, developed it into an uh, application in whichever field, be it music, be it technology, one deserves uh, the ownership of that and that justice is when we do not infringe upon that sense of uh, ownership, right. One must never sacrifice one's convictions to the opinions of others. That means integrity, that is what they are talking about. What is independence for them is not to be servile in one's judgment, to be 
uh, convinced only when one is convinced, not to be convinced because of authority or testimony. So, a strong, if you can read, a strong emphasis on the individual and an individual conception is what is being uh, relied on, right. Um, uh, 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 one must never attempt to fake reality in any uh, manner, which is the virtue of honesty. That means, one must not uh, get away by telling tales or stories which do not correlate. So, it is very essential that uh, uh, we do not uh, slip into jargon, we do not uh, uh, create a web of words that do not connect to the world out there. The world out there is our final answer manual to which we should be connected and which will give us the feedback whether we were right or not. Now, I continue. It means that one must never desire effects, effects without causes and that one must never enact a cause without assuming full responsibility of its effects. That one must never act like a zombie. What is a zombie? That is without knowing one's purposes and motives. That one must never make any decisions, form any convictions or seek any values out of context, that is apart from or against the total integrated sum of one's knowledge. And above all, that one must never seek to get away with contradictions. It means the rejection of any form of mysticism, that is any claim to some non-sensory, non-rational, non-rational, non-definable, supernatural source of knowledge. It means commitment to reason, not in sporadic fits or selected issues or in special emergencies, but as a permanent way of life. So, here what is the author reacting to? That is also what you have to infer, you have to unearth. The reaction is to mysticism, the reaction is to uh, religion uh, based on revelation that well, where we take something for granted without ourselves understanding it, but just by the power of testimony. That because a great person uh, or who is regarded as great has said so, or because it is in a holy book, therefore I believe it that is what she is protesting against. And there is no sphere of life that is suspended from this check of rationality. So, any source, non-sensory, non-rational, non-definable supernatural source of knowledge has to be discarded. Now, coming back to the, uh, coming to the core of the uh, objectivist ethics and what is it uh, that we value. The virtue of productiveness is the recognition of the fact that productive work is the process by which man's mind sustains his life. The process that sets man free of the necessity to adjust uh, himself to his background as all animals do and give him the power to adjust his background to himself. Productive work is the road of man's unlimited achievement and calls upon the highest attributes of his character, his creative ability, his ambitiousness, his self assertiveness his refusal to bear uncontested disasters, uh, his de and dedication to the goal of reshaping the earth in the image of his values. Productive work does not mean the unfocused performance of the motions of some job. It means consciously chosen pursuit of a productive career in any line of a rational endeavor, great or modest, on any level of ability. It is not the degree of man's ability nor the scale of his work that is ethically relevant here, but the fullest and most purposeful use of his mind. The virtue of pride is the recognition of the fact that as man must produce the physical values he needs to sustain his life, so he must acquire the values of character that make his life worth sustaining. That as man is being of self-made wealth, so he is a being of self-made soul. This is from Atlas Shrugged, her other book. The virtue of pride can best be described by the term of moral ambitiousness. So, productivity is important and productivity does not mean fake productivity, that is something that one produces on its own. And if you would look at it uh, in the uh, new world order or in the capitalist world order, production and productivity is seen as significant to give meaning in life. What to be productive in a day. Imagine our day to day vocabulary use product, uses the word productive as such a uh, venerable word and that is from a source that comes from uh, the this kind of thinking. Now, the virtue of uh, uh, after productivity she talks about the virtue of pride. The virtue of pride can best be described by the term 
moral ambitiousness. It means that one must earn the right to hold oneself as one's own uh, highest value by achieving one's own moral perfection, which one achieves by never accepting any code of irrational virtues impossible to practice and by never failing to practice the virtues one knows to be rational. By never accepting an unearned guilt and never earning any or if one has earned it, never leaving it uncorrected, by never resigning oneself passively to any flaws in one's character, by never placing any concern, wish, fear or mood of the moment above the reality of one's own self-esteem. And above all, it means one's rejection of the role of a sacrificial uh, animal, the rejection of any doctrine that preaches self-immolation as a moral virtue or uh, duty. So, here the emphasis is on rejection of uh, anything that one has not arrived at. So, unearned guilt or if one has earned a guilt, one has to correct it. So, this is about, uh, I would uh, relate it to the uh, claim of uh, man or humans being in the fallen state, that we need to be guilty of our existence and we need to continuously repay ourselves. Maybe from another uh, religious perspective, to be born with a baggage of uh, karma for which we need to, uh, we, uh, we would wish to uh, neutralize it or uh, compensate it. So, this sense of fundamental guilt that many religious practices uh, embody us or uh, push us into believing is something that uh, Ayn Rand and the objectivist ethics is arguing against. So, now to continue. The basic social, uh, let me take it to the top, yes, the, okay. the basic social principle of the objectivist ethics is that just as life is an end in itself, so every living human being is an end in himself, not the means to the ends or the welfare of others and therefore, that man must live for his own sake, neither sacrificing himself to others nor sacrificing others to himself. To live for this own sake means uh, that the achievement of his own happiness is man's highest moral purpose. Well, in this you can see the uh, foundations of individualism, which is very crucial to forming your, uh, the, the capitalist ethos or the objectivist ethics. Uh, ethos. Capitalist is a word easier for me to utter, that is why I use it frequently, but capitalism is only the economic model of the objectivist ethics. So, when I say capitalism, please also do understand it in the broader picture of the objectivist ethics. So, just as you, we hold life as an end in itself, every living being also is special enough to be an end in himself or herself and not to play a cog in the machine. Therefore, man must live neither live for his own sake, neither sacrificing himself to others nor sacrificing others to himself. So, that sense of pride, that sense of uh, independence is to be valued and that if you can connect uh, is uh, leads to the foundation of uh, individualism in this uh, philosophy of living. In psychological terms, the issue of man's survival does not confront his consciousness as an issue of life or death, but as an issue of happiness or suffering. Happiness is the successful state of life, suffering is the warning signal of failure, of death. Just as pleasure pain mechanism of man's body is an automatic indicator of his body's welfare or injury, a barometer of its basic alternative, life or death, so the emotional mechanism of man's consciousness is geared to perform the same function as a barometer that registers the same alternative by means of two basic emotions, joy or suffering. Emotions are the automatic results of man's value judgments integrated by his subconscious. Uh, uh, emotions are estimates of, which, of that which furthers man's values or threatens them, that which for him or against him, that which is for him or against him, lightning calculators giving him the sum of his profit or loss. But while the standard of value operating the physical pleasure pain mechanism of man's body is automatic and innate, 
determined by the nature of his body, the standard of value operating his emotional mechanism is not. Since man has no automatic knowledge, he can have no automatic values. Since he has no innate ideas, he can have no innate value judgments. So, here is a clear uh, denial that we are free, either you we see it as a uh, ability or we see it as a burden, but we are free and we have to exercise our choice. So, when uh, uh, unlike plants and animals, there is no automatic knowledge and there is no automatic mechanism in us. There are no innate ideas. Now, that is also a, a, a very significant philosophical position being taken that there uh, we have no innate ideas. Schools of philosophy also differ. Uh, for example, rationalism would ho hold that we have innate ideas, but that is uh, another argument. But anyway, this exposes the premises of the argument that the objectivist ethics are uh, holding. Man is born with an emotional mechanism, just as he is born with a cognitive mechanism, but at both, at, but at birth, both are tabula rasa, tabula rasa as in a blank slate, uh, fam made famous by Descartes, uh, uh, Descartes argument. It is man's cognitive faculty, his mind that determines the content of both. Man's emotional mechanism is like an electronic computer, which his mind has to program and the programming consists of the values his mind chooses. But since the work of uh, man's mind is not automatic, his values like all his premises are the product either of his thinking or of his evasions. Man chooses his values by a conscious process of thought or accepts them by default, by subconscious associations, on faith, on someone's authority by some form of social osmosis or blind imitation. Emotions are produced by man's premises held consciously or subconsciously, explicitly or implicitly. So, emotions are a consequence of the value systems that we hold and they are like feedback mechanisms and indicators where we, uh, uh, whether we are sticking or being true to our values that we uh, hold. Man has no choice about his capacity to feel that something is good for him or evil, but what he will consider good or evil, what will give him joy or pain, what he will love or hate, desire or fear depends on the standard of value. So, again denying here that there is no automatic way of knowing and feelings are not fundamental to determine what is right or wrong. Rather, once we have uh, determined our values the only uh, emotions only tell us whether we are being true to it or not. If he chooses irrational values, he switches his emotional mechanism from the role of his guardian to the role of his destroyer. The irrational is the impossible. It is that which contradicts the facts of reality. Facts cannot be altered by a wish, but they can destroy the wisher. If a man desires and pursues contradictions, if he wants to have his cake and eat it too, he disintegrates his consciousness. He turns his inner life into a civil war of blind force engaged in dark, incoherent, pointless, meaningless conflicts, which incidentally is the inner state of most people today. Ironically, this is written something maybe over uh, uh, almost uh, half a century back, but yet or maybe over a half a century back, but yet it still remains true that when we have self-contradictory desires, we are bound to a life of inner turmoil. And especially when the external world out there, especially in uh, the more affluent uh, parts of the world and uh, societies, uh, buffers the uh, consequences of the uh, unhappy consequences or the uh, difficult consequences of wrong decisions being taken and uh, insulates the person who has taken those wrong decisions is in a way encouraging uh, people to uh, into a life of inner turmoil. Happiness is that state of consciousness uh, which proceeds from the achievement of one's values. If a man uh, values productive work, his happiness, happiness is the measure of success in the service of his life. But if a man values destruction like a sadist, or self-torture like a masochist, or life beyond the grave like a mystic, or mindless kicks like the driver of a hot rod car, his alleged happiness is the measure of his success in the service of his own destruction. 
So, this is crucial that happiness is not a primary, happiness is uh, the state of consciousness which proceeds from achievement of one's values. Values are primary. So, the driver of a hot rod car or, or uh, people you have seen um, uh, rash driving on the road or uh, doing stunts on the road, bikers doing stunts on the road, that gives them happiness. There is a competition between these uh, true and stunt riders, they choose a time of the uh, day or night uh, in a desolate highway to practice their own stunts. So, and they are putting their lives in uh, a lot of risk, they are not being trained for it. This is not for professional uh, stunt drivers, but these are people who are uh, looking for that thrill. And in all societies, you can uh, find people in the boundary who are looking for these thrills. And they get happiness out of uh, reaching that level of thrill. So, because they get happiness, it does not make it right. That is the claim here. They get happiness, but because they have chosen something and they are meeting that. So, happiness is the, because something is giving you happiness does not make it right. What happiness is not a primary. So, what you choose and when you are reaching that, that is what gives you happiness. So, what you choose is very crucial. It must be added that the emotional state of all those irrationalists cannot be properly designated as happiness or even as pleasure. It is merely a moment's relief from their chronic state of terror, right. So, all these stunt riding or uh, sadism, masochism that we talk about, that uh, she does not even dignify it by uh, calling it as uh, happiness, rather it is their moments relief from a chronic state of terror, a general unhappy life where this seems to be a, uh, a, a, a moments relief. Neither life nor happiness can be achieved uh, by the pursuit of irrational whims, just as man is free to attempt to survive by any random means as a parasite, as a mooch, moocher or a looter, but not free to succeed as it, uh, succeed at it beyond the range of the moment. So, he is free to seek his happiness in any irrational fraud, any whim, any delusion, any mindless escape from reality, but not free to succeed at it beyond the range of the moment, nor to escape the uh, consequences. I quote from Galt's speech, happiness is a state of non-contradictory joy. Sorry, um, a joy without penalty or guilt, a joy that does not clash with any of your values and does not work for your own destruction. Happiness is possible only to a rational man. The man he, who desires nothing but rational goals, seeks nothing but rational values and finds joy in nothing but rational actions. The maintenance of life and the pursuit of happiness are not two separate issues. To hold one's life uh, as one's ultimate value and one's own happiness as one's highest purpose are two aspects of the same achievement. Existentially, the activity of pursuing rational goals is the activity of maintaining one's life. Psychologically, the result, reward and com uh, concomitment is an emotional state of happiness. It is by experiencing happiness that one lives one's life in any hour, year or the whole of it. And when one experiences the kind of pure happiness that is an end in itself, the kind that makes one think this is worth living for, what one is greeting and affirming in emotional terms is the metaphysical fact that life is an end in itself. So, rational values are important and uh, chasing these rational values are important. Now, this uh, very much uh, uh, can be seen as contradicting or questioning what modern day say postmoderns as they are called would be questioning that if I find my happiness in uh, uh, building a, a, a sand castle and then destroying it uh, and which no way adds to my life something that gives me innate uh, happiness is something that where they will not or dis, uh, severely disagree with what the objectivist ethics claims. So, I invite you to or provoke you to go ahead and think of modern day phenomenon, the lives that we inhabit, which are uh, in uh, uh, contradiction to the claims that the author is making here. But the relationship uh, of a cause to effect cannot be reversed. It is only accepting man's life as one's primary and by pursuing the rational values, it requires that one can achieve happiness. 
not by taking happiness as some undefined irreducible primary and then attempting to live by its guidance. If you achieve that which is good by a rational standard of value, it will necessarily make you happy. But that which makes you happy by some undefined emotional standard is not necessarily the good. To take whatever makes one happy as a guide to action means to be guided by nothing but one's emotional wheel, uh, whims. Emotions are not tools of cognition to be guided by whims. This is crucial that emotions are not tools of cognition, but to be guided by whims, by desires whose source, nature and meaning one does not know, is to turn oneself into a blind robot operated by unknowable demons, by one stale evasions, a robot knocking its stagnant brains out against the walls of reality, which it refuses to see. Well, this is subtlety is not the uh, style of uh, Ayn Rand and she almost um, cruelly, mercilessly ridicules uh, the emotivist by saying, if you are looking, do whatever makes you happy. That is quite a uh, uh, in contemporary phase today, phrase today that well, do whatever gives you happiness. So, she strongly disagrees with that. Do whatever gives you happiness is like leaving your uh, life's rudder to chance and to drive whatever, wherever you wish to go. But uh, you want to do something else. E emotions are not tools of cognition, uh, because if you surrender to emotions, then you are surrendering to whims. So, um, and she compares it to the notion of the uh, robot. This is the fallacy inherent in hedonism, hedonism where pleasure is the standard of uh, what is right. Uh, in any variant of ethical hedonism, personal or social, individual or collective, happiness can properly be the purpose of ethics, but not the standard. The task of ethics is de to define man's proper code of values and thus to give him the means of uh, achieving happiness, to declare as the ethical hedonists do that the proper value is whatever gives you pleasure is to declare that the uh, proper value is uh, whatever you happen to value, which is an act of intellectual and philosophical abdication, an act which is an act which merely proclaims the futility of ethics and invites all men to play uh, it deuces wild. So, but, uh, whatever you happen to value is valuable is not the way to go. There is a way, a rational way of arriving at what is worth valuing. The philosophers who attempted to devise an allegedly rational code of ethics gave mankind nothing but a choice of whims. The selfish pursuit of one's own whims, such as ethics of Nietzsche or selfless service to the whims of others, such as the ethics of Bentham, Mill, Comte and all uh, social hedonists, whether they allowed man to include his own whims among the millions of others or advised him to turn himself into a totally selfless schmoo that seeks to be eaten by others. Okay. Uh, here you can get the tone, the almost uh, ridiculing aggressive tone of uh, Ayn Rand's writing where uh, she uh, strongly critiques, well, when we expect human beings to work either on their whims or their own whims or social whims or the whims of some thinkers, but not to work from self-enlightenment. So, she is asking that one tries to self-enlighten to work on their uh, values rather than inheriting one. When a desire regardless of its nature or cause is taken as an ethical primary, and the grati gratification of any and all desire is taken as an ethical goal, such as the greatest happiness of the greatest number, the typical utilitarian uh, ethos. Men have no choice but to hate, fear and fight one another, because their desires and their interests will necessarily clash. If desire is the ethical standard, then one man's desire to produce and another man's desire to rob him have equal validity. One man's desire to be free and another man's desire to enslave him have equal ethical validity. One man's desire to be loved and admired for his virtues and another man's desire for undeserved love and um, unearned admission have equal ethical validity. 
and if the frustration of any desire constitutes a sacrifice, then a man who owns an automobile and is robbed of it is being sacrificed, but so is the man who wants or aspires to an automobile which the owner refuses to give him, and these two sacrifices have equal ethical status. If so, then man's only choice is to ra rob or to be robbed, to destroy or to be destroyed, to sacrifice others to any uh, uh, desire of his own or to sacrifice himself to any desire of others. Then man's only ethical alternative is to be a sadist or a masochist. So, this reminds me of uh, looking at the taxation system. Now, if you are a hardcore capitalist, you would look at the uh, taxation system, especially when you tax the rich to subsidize the poor as uh, a kind of moral cannibalism. And uh, philosophers like Robert Nozick have, or uh, uh, philosophers like Nozick have also um, uh, argued against this that, well, if you are working for uh, 100 days, suppose, and you are paying 20 percent tax for the, uh, uh, not for the maintenance of uh, security and law and order, uh, which says requires 10 percent of uh, your earnings or so 10 days in 100 days you work for your own security, which is the role of the government as the night watchman. But another 10 percent or 10 days of your 100 days of work for uh, subsidizing the uh, poor, then one is uh, in, uh, engaging in moral cannibalism. One is forcing the wealthy to work for funding the uh, poor. So, this can look very, uh, sound very harsh and cruel, but this also needs to be understood without an emotional reaction that this is how the um, uh, capitalist would argue, irrespective of the side uh, uh, of their place in the uh, wealth chain. Right? So, this is a system that is being argued for irrespective of where one's location in the wealth chain is. So, the moral cannibalism of all hedonist and altruist doctrines lie in the premise that happiness of one man necessitates the injury of another. So, the happiness of one man necessitates the injury of another. How is it in the case of hedonist? Well, hedonists wants their own pleasure, so they uh, think they can harm others to get their own pleasure. The altruist wants the others pleasure and therefore, uh, willingly suffers, uh, inflict suffering on uh, his or her own self to give pleasure to the other. In both the cases, it is an act of moral cannibalism. Today, most people hold this premise as an absolute not to be questioned. And when one speaks of man's right to exist for his own sake, for his own rational self-interest, uh, most people assume automatically that this means that his uh, right to sacrifice others, such an assumption is a confession of their own belief that to injure, enslave, rob or murder others is in uh, man's self-interest, which he must selflessly renounce. The idea that man's self-interest can be served only by a non-sacrificial relationship with others has never occurred to those humanitarian apostles of unselfishness, who proclaim their desire to achieve the brotherhood of men and it will not occur to them or to anyone as long as the concept of rational is omitted from the concept of values, desires, self-interest and ethics. Now, again, uh, that is quite a, a ridiculing tone, but uh, looking at the apostles of unselfishness that uh, claims for charity that why do not you give all more than what you uh, barely need, anything other than what you barely need, because there is a lot of suffering in the world there and they do have their point of argument. But, and that is quite politically correct, and but yet uh, as a philosopher, you have to be open to ideas that are relevant may not be politically correct. And here, this is one politically incorrect idea, uh, popularly politically incorrect, but here claiming that, well, uh, we are not entitled or one, the uh, better off are not entitled to serve the uh, ill of. And uh, any set of values that requires the sacrificial of one to uh, for the benefit of the other is being moral cannibalistic. right? The objectivist ethics proudly advocates and upholds uh, rational selfishness, which means the values required for man's survival qua man, which means uh, the values required for human survival, not the values produced by desires, the emotions, the aspirations, the feelings, the whims or the needs of irrational brutes 
who have never outgrown the primordial practice of human sacrifices, have never discovered an industrial society and can conceive of no self-interest but that of grabbing the loot of the moment. So, the, uh, uh, now here she introduces the, uh, or defines another crucial term called the, what she means as rational selfishness. Rational selfishness is not the same as the uh, selfish uh, looter or moocher who is trying to snatch each other's property, snatch whatever they want to snatch. So, uh, and this is why it is not survival ethics. Survival ethics does not mean just uh, robbing and snatching from the other, which in a certain connotation survival ethics stands for. So, to be selfish is, uh, is, is to be selfish about the values required for man's survival qua man. That means, how man should survive, man as man, which means the values required for human survival, not the values produced by desires, emotions, aspirations so, uh, and other irrational brutes who have never outgrown. So, the irrational, the unearned. So, those are not, those desires, all desires are not equal. So, the desire of a, uh, a looter is not the same thing, uh, ca cannot be equally uh, ethically valid as the desire of a producer. So, um, rational selfishness is when we have the values that are rationally arrived at, not just any desire as equally rational or uh, uh, equally compelling. The objectivist ethics holds that the human good does not require human sacrifices and cannot be achieved by the sacrifice of anyone to anyone. It holds that rational interests of men do not clash. There is no conflict of interests among men who do not desire the unearned, who do not make the sacrifices or nor accept them, who deal with one another as traders giving uh, value for value. The principle of trade is the only rational ethical principle of all human relationships, personal, social, private and public, spiritual and material. It is the principle of justice. So, now here as we uh, have talked in the, uh, towards the end of the uh, presentation on this particular chapter, that trade is being regarded as an example of justice, um, giving the example of fr uh, friendship that you, you are friends with a person because you exchange value with each other. Value to your life, you add value to your friend's life. But if you are just a friend uh, or if your friend is just ranting about uh, his or her uh, uh, sob story all through uh, or uh, ranting about his uh, achievements and expects you to listen, then that is really not a friendship and it probably will not last. So, all lasting relation, the sense of justice is when there is a exchange a trade between values. A trader is a man who earns what he gets and does not give or take the undeserved. So, it is not even about giving charity. So, look at it this way. Uh, if, if you are uh, prone to think that well, uh, taking the unearned is uh, incorrect, but you might dole or give as charity, even that itself is incorrect according to the objectivist ethics that is uh, uh, wrong, because you should not even give the unearned, you have to make the other earn it. He deals with men by means of a free voluntary uh, unforced uncoerced exchange, an exchange which benefits both uh, parties by their own independent judgment. A trader does not expect to be paid for his defaults, only for his achievements, crucial to uh, acknowledge that. He does not switch to others uh, the burden of his failures and he does not mortgage his life into uh, bondage to the failures of others. So, two issues that can uh, uh, make uh, can be relevant here is one what we have already talked about is the, um, uh, is, is the act of uh, governments uh, for giving loans or doling out uh, broken businesses or doling out banks which are uh, supposedly too big to fail. Uh, looking at these is that then we are even to accept that dole, you are not a winner, you are a loser in uh, the books of objectivist ethics because you are accepting the unearned. The second thing is about the notion of charity, of philanthropy. The philanthropy is being about and, and to think of this uh, in, in its uh, strictest form, the objectivist ethics would uh, uh, dissuade philanthropy to be done uh, because you are. Uh, the philanthropist is giving something 
to the undeserved that each person should have that sense of self respect so it almost reminds me of satris uh, i think it's satris uh, notion of punishment that where if you have done something wrong and a punishment uh, and you deserve a punishment but you are uh, condoned is that something for you to be happy probably you have a, a escaped the physical problems associated with the punishment but you have been belittled your human agency has been belittled and that is why punishment is your right because that's your right to uh, uh, redemption but if you are uh, forgiven like we forgive children uh, often it is also undermining their agency so if you are forgiven as an adult your agency is being undermined in spiritual issues by spiritual i mean pertaining to man's consciousness the currency or medium of exchange is different but the principle is the same love friendship respect admiration are the emotional responses of uh, one man to the virtues of another the spiritual payment given in exchange for the personal selfish pleasure personal selfish pleasure which one man derives from the virtues of another man's character only a brute or an altruist would claim that the appreciation of another person's virtues is an act of selflessness that as far as one's own selfish interest and pleasure are concerned it makes no difference whether one deals with a genius or a fool whether one meets a hero or a thug whether one marries an ideal woman or a slut in spiritual issues a trader is a man who does not seek to be loved for his weaknesses or flaws only for his virtues uh, and who does not grant his love to the weaknesses or the flaws of others only to their uh, virtues to love is to value only a rationally selfish uh, man a man of self esteem is capable of love because he is the only man capable of holding firm consistent uncompromising unbetrayed values the man who does not value himself cannot value anything or anyone it is only on the basis of rational selfishness on the basis of justice that men can be fit to live together in a free peaceful prosperous benevolent rational society uh, okay now here uh, i'll stick the example of a relationship say a, a romantic relationship now if a romantic relationship is based on a sense of uh, empathy on a sense of kindness on a sense of charity right one is suffering and the other one is uh, feels very sorry about the other suffering and that is the strongest bond in the association then according to the objectivist ethics that is not a uh, a relationship of love because to love is to value equally to add value to each other so i think that can serve as a beautiful rendition of human relationships where uh, as 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 a uh, significant other we require that person to uh, value us just as we value them neither to be uh, servile to us nor expect us to be servile to them to be uh, val- add value to their lives and for the other to add value to one's own life so that as understanding what it means to be uh, in love or in a significant romantic relationship okay uh, can man derive any personal benefit from living in a human society now from moving from uh, moving from love to the basis of human society so what is the personal benefit of uh, living in a human society perhaps uh, uh, the objectivist ethics has been sounding too individualistic uh, celebrating the individual but what is the role of uh, love first which she elaborated and then society can man derive any personal benefit from living in a human society yes if it is a human society two great values to be gained from social existence are knowledge and trade these are the two significant values man is the only species that can transmit and expand his store of knowledge from generation to generation the knowledge potentially available to man is greater than any one man could begin to acquire in his own lifespan every man gains an incalculable benefit from the knowledge discovered by others the second great benefit is the division of labor it enables a man to devote his effort to uh, 
a particular form of cooperation uh, allows all, uh, sorry I lost track of it, I will just come back to it, yes. Uh, the second great benefit is the division of labor. It enables man to devote his effort to a particular field of work and to trade with others who specialize in other fields. This form of cooperation allows all men who take part in it to achieve a greater knowledge, skills and productive uh, return on their effort than they could have ach achieved if they had to produce everything he needs on a desert island or on a self-sustaining uh, farm. Now, here, uh, two, two very crucial uh, uh, values that she talks about of social existence is knowledge and trade. One is that we cannot understand the whole cosmos in our, own, uh, in our individual lives, rather because we have the advantage of libraries as collective memories of mankind, as knowledge which can be transmitted from one generation to other, there is so much knowledge that we can acquire in one life, tremendous. And uh, perhaps to, uh, to uh, 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 if I remember correctly, Harari's work, uh, Yuval Noah Harari's work on uh, Sapiens or one of his uh, sequels also talks about that the real strength of human beings is not their, uh, uh, their, their significant brain size and intellect, but rather their ability to network. And that is where even uh, this is something that has been long anticipated back, uh, long back anticipated by Ayn Rand, where she says that the, uh, when she talks about division of labor, that there is so much we can do because we can network, that we can uh, connect people's efforts together and then bring about changes, right. So, these are classic ideas that have been surviving all through. And now, let me continue. But these very benefits indicate, delimit and define what kind of men can be of value to one another and in what kind of society. Only rational, productive, independent men in a rational, productive, free society. Parasites, moochers, looters, brutes and thugs can be of no value to human being, nor can he gain any benefit from uh, living in a society geared to their needs demands and protection. A society that treats him as a sacrificial animal and penalizes him for his virtues in order to reward them for their vices, which means a society based on the ethics of altruism. No society can be of value to a man's life if the price is the surrender of his rights to life. Now, uh, look at it this way. Uh, to, to make a rather uh, uh, politically incorrect or uh, or in that sense a uh, 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 rather simplistic understanding. If you look at the view or, or the data for migrations across countries in the world, you will probably find uh, migrations taking place from uh, less free societies to free societies, right, where talent is rewarded, is blossomed is allowed to uh, uh, blossom. Uh, look at uh, say the example of societies, say uh, societies torn or countries we know that are torn by civil wars. Now, they are not even producing enough. They are uh, in a perpetual state of chaos and uh, uh, fight. People and, and we have heard of uh, countries in where people uh, take perilous journeys to migrate into neighboring uh, affluent countries journeys that can even cost them their life, but because their home countries are uh, uh, strife or, or, or filled with uh, strife and civil war, that uh, there is no scope for production, there is no scope for flourishing. And this is what he can, uh, when, when, the, when she says that, uh, if no society can be of value to man's life, if the price is the surrender of the right to his life. The basic political uh, principle of the objectivist ethics is no man may initiate the use of physical force against others. No man or group or society or government has the right to assume the role of a criminal and initiate the use, uh, use of a physical compulsion against any man. Men have the right to use physical force only in retaliation and only against those who initiate its use. The ethical principle involved is simple and clear cut. It is the differentiate, uh, difference between murder and self-defense. 
a hold up man seeks to gain a value uh, wealth by killing his victim the victim does not grow richer by killing up a uh, killing a hold up man the principle is no man may obtain any values from others by resorting to physical force the only proper uh, the only proper moral purpose of a government is to protect man's rights which means to protect him from physical violence to protect uh, his right to his own life to his own liberty to his own property and to the pursuit of his own happiness without property rights no other rights are uh, possible so when we look at this uh, two notions uh, introduced here about government and property so what's the role of government okay and preliminary prior to that is legitimacy of force force can be used only to prevent uh, or to control uh, uncalled for aggression and the job of government is to protect him or uh, the citizen uh, from physical violence and notice here a crucial fact in fact uh, this particular highlighted text uh, sounds so similar to the uh, philosophy and ethos of a uh, of north america uh, particularly the united states of america uh, when we look at property property now is coming out to be as very significant property as expression of one's individual self so property is not just an asset for you to use it's also something to be valued there is a moral component to property and a morally rightful deserved component to property okay let me continue i will not attempt in a brief lecture to discuss the political theory of objectivism those who are interested will find it presented in full detail in atlas shrugged i will say only that every political system is based on and derived from a theory of ethics and that the objectivist ethics is the moral base needed by that political economic system which today is being destroyed all over the world destroyed precisely for lack of a moral philosophical defense and validation the original american system capitalism if it perishes it will perish by default undiscovered and unidentified no other subject has ever been hidden by so many distortions misconceptions and misrepresentations today few people know what capitalism is how it works and what has its actual history when i say capitalism i mean full pure uncontrolled unregulated laissez faire uh, capitalism with a separation of state and economics in the same way and for the same reasons as the separation of state and church a pure system of capitalism has never yet existed not even in america she means united states of america various degrees of government control had been undercutting and distorting it from the start capitalism is not the system of the past it is the system of future if mankind is to have a future for those who are interested uh, in the history or in psychological causes of the philosophers treason against capitalism i will mention that i discuss them in the title essay of my book for the new intellectual the present discussion uh, has to be confined to the subject of ethics i have presented the barest essentials of my system but they are different to indicate in what manner the objectivist ethics is the morality of life as against the three major, major schools of the ethical theory the mystic the social and the subjective which have brought the world to its uh, present state which represent the morality of death uh, so here now she moves to the first person and in the first person she is uh, conspicuously uh, clearly defending capitalism because it is being written at a time when the capitalism was quite under attack and if you are viewing from india you have uh, you may be aware that uh, if you look at the cinemas that or the movies that are popular movies or in general movies that were produced say uh, 30 40 years back say 70s or 80s typically 90s uh, with uh, amitabh bachchan the star being uh, touted as the angry young man there was a, a theme to that particular uh, uh, popular uh, uh, character the angry young man was angry because he found injustice and who were causing the injustice the capitalists were causing injustice so the, uh, as as known uh, as uh, as ridiculed as the sates the sates were the one who were causing injustice and here is the angry young man character who is rebelling against the uh, these 
a clout of rich people, the wealthy people who uh, apparently are sucking away the money from society and there was an anger towards these uh, wealthy people and that is what popular media always captures, the popular sentiment of the anger against the uh, wealthy who were seemingly uh, sucking up the wealth of the nation. Right? So, India had a history of nationalization of uh, uh, private enterprise of thorough government control and then again the world changed in 1990s when the uh, Indian economy decided or had to open up. Wealth started being celebrated. If you look today uh, for people who have uh, um, maybe who are in their 40s or uh, so who have been looking uh, who have had experience of the in 1980s, 90s and today's India, you can see so much of difference. Today, uh, entrepreneurs are being celebrated as they are being said as wealth creators, wealth generators. These changes have occurred because we have now imbibed a, uh, a philosophy that is closer to what the uh, objectivist ethics uh, hold. The th three schools of uh, differ only in their method of approach, not in their content. In content, they are uh, merely variants of altruism, the ethical theory which regards man as a sacrificial animal, which holds that man has no right to exist for his own sake, that service to others is the only justification for his uh, existence and that self-sacrifice is his highest moral duty, virtue and value. The difference occurs only over the question of who is to be sacrificed and to whom. Altruism holds death as its ultimate goal and standard of value. Ayn Rand would have hated Mother Teresa, probably. And it is uh, logical, uh, okay, that was just uh, colloquially or uh, jokingly said, but she would disagree with the philosophy of Mother Teresa, uh, probably. But again, Mother Teresa, we will look at it uh, uh, in a more nuanced manner, it would be because when it is. Uh, I am sure if the capitalist would question that when suffering is caused not by your own doing, but by chance, can there be a role of subsidy or intervention over there, right? If somebody is affected with a life threatening disorder, let us say typically uh, terminal illnesses or cancer, can we, uh, would the capitalist say that no, they should suffer their consequences? I do not think so, it is not going to be so heartless. Uh, the capitalists have always been critiqued for being heartless, but uh, I do not think this is the extent to which uh, the objectivist ethics would go on. So, especially sufferings that are self inflicted or uh, come from uh, incorrect decisions that one himself makes. Okay. So, altruism holds death as its ultimate goal and standard of value and it is it is logical that renunciation, resignation, self denial and every other form of suffering including self destruction are the virtues it advocates. And logically these are the only things that practitioners of altruism have achieved and are achieving now. Observe that these three schools of ethical theory are anti life, not merely in content, but also in the method of their approach. So, uh, uh, this uh, she talks about the mystic, the subjectivist and who is the third one. Um, so, the three uh, what she is protesting against or reacting to what was at time the social, the subjective and the mystic. right? So, uh, and for all of them she, uh, she would charge them with the charge of moral cannibalism and with using death as their ultimate goal. And uh, let us see how she breaks them down one by one. The mystic theory of ethics, uh, so she says observe that these three schools of ethical theory are anti life, not merely in content, but also in their method of approach. The mystic theory of ethics is explicitly based on the premise that the standard of value of man's ethics is set beyond the grave by the laws or requirements of another supernatural dimension, that ethics is impossible for man to practice, that it is unsuited and opposed to man's life on earth uh, and uh, that man must take the blame for it and suffer through the whole of his earthly existence to atone the, uh, for the guilt of being unable to practice the impracticable. The dark ages and the middle ages are the existential monument to this theory of ethics, right? When religion asks too much from people and it is based on uh, uh, whims or uh, just some uh, revelation which uh, seems to be, which, which she argues for as unjustified. 
the social theory of ethics substitutes society for God. And although it claims that its chief concern is life on earth, it is not the life of man, not the life of an individual, but the life of a disembodied entity, the collective, which in every relation to every individual consists of everybody except himself. As far as the individual is concerned, his ethical duty is to be selfless, voiceless, rightless, uh, slave of any need, claim or demand asserted by others. The motto dog eat, do dog eat dog, which is not applicable to capitalism nor to dogs, is applicable to the social theory of ethics. The existential monuments of, to this theory are Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia. Right? So, uh, uh, the dog eat dog world, what typically is about, uh, has been critiqued as how capitalism works, is something she clearly denies because here, uh, well, uh, it is not about snatching value but about creating value. So, for her, capitalism is not a zero sum game that uh, the meat, uh, one man's meat is another man's poison, rather, it is a game of growing the pie, so that everybody can have a share of it. So, you become wealthy by growing the pie. I always give the example of, uh, say the uh, uh, IPL cricket tournaments. So, the, I think it is called the Indian Premier League. So, it is a set of uh, uh, short duration matches held with uh, teams constructed and uh, a new idea that suddenly now uh, is quite popular and has uh, generated a lot of wealth. Now, the zero sum game way of looking at IPL would be that well, the m money is being moved from people's pockets into IPL and that will be a zero sum game of look, uh, looking at it. But the other way of looking at it is that money is being generated, value is being generated. It is not, uh, people are paying for the tickets or advertisers are advertising and the entire economy is moving and money is being generated. So, when we look at wealth as a zero sum game, that is one philosophy of living. Uh, whereas, when we look at wealth as uh, an ever growing pie, that it is not a zero sum game and value can be generated, it is not a fixed value that has to be transferred from here and there, that is another or the capitalist way of looking at things. So, now she talks about Russia with the uh, Soviet Russia and G Nazi Germany about where social uh, 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 society became the cornerstone of uh, morality. The subjectivist uh, theory of ethics is strictly speaking not a theory, but a negation of ethics and more. It is a negation of reality, a negation not merely of man's existence, but of all existence. Only the concept of a fluid, plastic, indeterminate, Heraclitian universe could permit anyone to think or to preach that man needs no objective principles of action, that reality gives him uh, a blank check on values, that anything he cares to pick up as the good or evil will do, that man's whim as a valid moral standard, uh, that the only question is how to get away with it. The existential monument to this is theory is the present state of our culture. So, she's almost thematically looked at it in a temporal fashion. The ancient times in the western world, the times of medieval and ancient times where mystics and religious practices dominate our, our moral life, followed which with society and typically she's talking about Soviet uh, Russia and Nazi Germany. And now, the current stage where we are all uh, in a sense of moral anarchy, that whatever we like to do is what is to be done. It is not men's immorality that is, irres that is responsible for the collapse now threatening to destroy the civilized world, but the kind of moralities men have been asked to practice. The responsibility belongs to philosophers of altruism. They have no cause to be shocked by the spectacle of their own success and no right to damn human nature. Men have obeyed them and have obey brought their moral ideas into full reality. It is philosophy that sets man's goals and determines their course. It is only philosophy that can save them now. Today, the world is facing a choice. If civilization is to survive, it is the altruist morality that men have to reject. I will close with the words of John Galt, which I address as he did to all the moralists of altruism, past or present. You have been using your fear as your weapon and have been bringing death to man as his punishment for rejecting your morality. We offer him life as his reward and for accepting ours. So, this is uh, uh, in a way we have explored uh, altruism by arguing, uh, looking at a text arguing against it. So, uh, life affirming morality that is what the author talks about it. Now, uh, reflecting uh, uh, a little meta reflection on this exercise. Now, to the beginning of this exercise, I thought that this uh, reading of the text, that I did not know how it would go about, how would I feel about it, how will it be received, 
will it be worthwhile or will it just be uh, reading out a text? Um, well, that uh, of course you are welcome to share your opinions on this, but for me it has been surprisingly fruitful. Uh, because once you read text closely, no matter, and this is, I have read it for nth times, this is another uh, time that I am reading it, but it is when I read closely and I am almost conversing with myself for the want of an audience, it was not as dull, drab and boring that I feared. Rather, it had moments of a lot of uh, uh, new uh, provocations and ideas that came along to it. So I hope it has served the same to you. And with this, we end the second module of uh, the course on moral thinking. And we will start with the uh, third module next. Thank you.